Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and the patrons over on Patreon chose for me to animate the fight for McPherson's Ridge on the first day at Gettysburg. But I didn't want to just talk about McPherson's Ridge, I wanted to talk about the first shot of the battle, and that leads up to McPherson's Ridge. I hope you all enjoy this description of the opening salvos of the epic battle of Gettysburg. Major General Henry Heath and his division were headed toward the town of Gettysburg by about 5 a.m. on July 1st. He had reports that Federals occupied the town, but he was unable to verify what size of a force opposed him there. Brigadier General John Buford and his division guarded the town, but the rest of the Union Army was on their way. He needed to hold off Heath and perform a delaying action until the 1st Corps could make their way to the field. He sent out advanced skirmishers to Marsh Creek. He deployed his two brigades across McPherson's Ridge, Colonel William Gamble's brigade on the left and Colonel Thomas Devon on the right. As the Confederates approached Marsh Creek, Buford's men opened fire at about 7.30 a.m., signaling the beginning of the Battle of Gettysburg. To give the impression of having a large artillery force, Buford spread out his six guns over the battlefield, two on the north side of the Chambersburg Pike, two just on the other side of the pike, and two on McPherson's Ridge, to the right of the 8th New York. Heath's skirmishers, which outnumbered Buford's five to one, pushed the horsemen back toward the town, but the stiff resistance by Buford's men was draining the rebel skirmishers, who had pushed the Federals back over a mile and a half by that point. Heath realized that this wouldn't be an easy task and deployed his first two brigades, Brigadier General Joseph Davis's brigade to the north of Chambersburg Pike and Brigadier General James Archer's brigade south of the pike. Davis arrived first, but he was still organizing his force. What he didn't know was that the cavalry who were defending the ridge were about to get relieved. John F. Reynolds's first corps troops were making their way to the field. Lysander Cutler's brigade was in the lead, crossing over fields and dismantling fences to reach the location of battle. Cutler split up his regiments, placing three south of the pike and two north of it. Davis's brigade was bearing down on the position when the 56th Pennsylvania leveled their rifles and fired into the 55th North Carolina. Stunned but determined, the North Carolinians and the 2nd Mississippi fired back. The 76th New York had not made it to the flank of the 58th yet, but they were hit by rifle fire anyway. Their commander, Major Andrew Grover, thought it was friendly fire and ordered the men to hold their fire, but another volley ripped into them. They filed into the line and they could finally see the enemy who had been firing at them. Their position had been concealed by the rolling landscape. Seeing that the 56th flank was in the air, the 147th New York crossed the pike and the unfinished railroad cut. A deadly firefight would erupt between them and the 42nd Mississippi. On the right, the 76th New York pulled back to their right to guard against the approaching 55th North Carolina. The commander of the Tar Heels, Colonel John Connolly, grabbed the flag of his regiment and with a yell rushed toward the enemy. He went down with a debilitating wound. The second in command rushed over to him. Connolly said, take the colors and keep ahead of the Mississippians. The rebels put up enough pressure on the flank that the two regiments were ordered to fall back. This left the 147th for the most part alone. They were nearly surrounded, but were ordered to fall back. Some of them miraculously escaped, but out of the 380 men who entered the battle, only 79 made it to safety, the rest having been killed, wounded, or captured. The 84th New York and 59th New York were in a tight spot. Davis's men were bearing down on them from the north, and Archer's brigade had began to cross Willoughby Run. Destruction looked to be their fate, but as Davis was organizing his men for an attack, the next brigade of the 1st Corps arrived, the Iron Brigade. The 6th Wisconsin filed into the right of the 95th, and together, all three regiments threw lead into the approaching rebels. After a few volleys, the enemy disappeared. They had sought refuge in an unfinished railroad cut. The Mississippians were now in a jumbled mass in the cut, unable to fire effectively on the enemy because of how steep the walls of the cut were. Many of the North Carolinians remained outside the cut on the north side. Lieutenant Colonel Dawes of the 6th Wisconsin saw an opportunity. He ordered his men to charge, along with the 95th New York, and they scrambled over the fences toward the cut. The rebels fired volleys into the exposed Federals, but they charged on. The 84th followed the other two regiments' lead. When the men from Wisconsin and New York got to the cut, they saw an entangled mass of men. The Mississippians were trapped. Some Federals called for surrender and others fired into the cut. Some of the rebels escaped, but many saw the futility in attempting to resist and surrendered. A melee erupted when some members of the Iron Brigade went into the cut and attempted to capture the 2nd Mississippi's flag. Several were wounded in the attempt, but in the end, Corporal Francis Waller was able to subdue the color bearer and take control of the flag. He would receive the Medal of Honor for his actions. 
More than 225 Confederates surrendered in the cut, but it wasn't all glory for the 6th. They had lost about half their men in the fight as well. The destruction of those three Union regiments led to them seeking cover on Oak Ridge with the rest of Cutler's brigade. To the south, Archer's brigade was about to cross Willoughby Run and encounter the Iron Brigade on the other side. Since Federal commanders were having to feed the regiments into battle as they came up, this produced an, an echelon attack. The 2nd Wisconsin was in the lead, followed by the 7th Wisconsin, the 19th Indiana, and the 24th Michigan. The Federal regiments were ordered to load on the march and had to pass through multiple fences, which broke up their ranks. As they entered Herbst Woods, the 14th and 7th Tennessee regiments unleashed a deadly volley into the Badgers. It was around this time that Major General John F. Reynolds, the commander of the 1st Corps, was killed. Many of the Tennesseans laid down on their backs to load and rolled over to deliver their volleys into the enemy. Despite the destructive fire, the 2nd Wisconsin held on. Instead of the 7th Wisconsin coming up to their aid, they waited for the 19th Indiana and 24th Michigan to form on their left, before proceeding. Before they moved out, the 13th Alabama began to move in on the flank of the 2nd Wisconsin. Miraculously, the single regiment held on until the rest of the Iron Brigade surged forward. The 13th Alabama was stunned by the attack and gave way, exposing the Tennessee regiments to flanking fire. When the Tennesseans saw the Alabamians retreating, they were confused because they were holding their own, but with their flank threatened, they too were forced to withdraw. Out of the 1,100 men in Archer's brigade, 375 were casualties, most being captured, including Archer himself. Colonel Burkett Fry of the 13th Alabama would then take control of the brigade. The Union held off the assaults on the west and northwest side of the town, but now more Confederate brigades were making their way to the sound of battle. Part of Ewell's Corps was making its way to the field. Robert Rhodes' division of that corps reached the battlefield before early and prepared to attack Oak Ridge. The 11th Corps in the form of Barlow and Short's divisions were also on the field and preparing to deploy their troops to the north end of town.